Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 11, titled Forgive Us Our Debts, which delivers on the name. This is a really strong episode, and there's a big twist at the end. I'm a fan I'm a fan of the episodes where there's the twist. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered on December 12th, 1986. It was directed by Jan Ellisberg, who's got two more episodes upcoming, but this is the first time we've seen Jan. The episode is written, though, by Gustav Reiniger. Or Reiniger? And although it didn't write that many Miami Vice episodes, I think this is the only one, is the co-creator of Crime Story. You can see the Miami Vice coalescing around Crime Story. Mm -hmm. Michael Mann and Gustav Reiniger and and then Dennis Farina. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Before we get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, I got one for us this week. I follow a lot of things around Don Johnson. I have lots of Google alerts that are set up about Don. And I had one come in this week for a brand new movie that he's going to be in with Vince Vaughn. Now, before you check out, before you say... I'm already done. I'm not listening anymore. (laughs) Nope. Done. (laughs) The movie title is Brawl in Cell Block 99. And I watched the trailer and it's actually, it's a serious crime drama. It's not a, not a comedy? No, it's a crime thriller. And it looks really good, actually. So let, let me read you a little bit of the synopsis here. This is a Vince Vaughn like you've never seen. The actor plays Bradley Thomas, a former boxer who loses his job as an auto mechanic. Thomas, whose wife, Lauren, played by Jennifer Carpenter, is on the brink of leaving him, takes a job as a drug courier for an old friend. He ends up in a gunfight with some cops, leaving him wounded and in prison. The prison, which is run by Warden Tugs, played by Don Johnson. Uh-oh. Becomes a battlefield oh. for Thomas with his enemies force when his enemies force his hand. So is Don Johnson going to be a bad guy in this? He's the he's a warden, and I saw in the clip of the trailer he looks really good, but he looks great. He's got I, like a I'm solo curious, mustache. Uh, so is Owen Wilson playing like his funky cellmate? <laughs> No, what, it's, what's Owen Wilson's character? He's got to do something in the movie. I mean, he, it's a Vince he Vaughn movie. He's got to be in it. <laughs> He's just yelling from the background. Wow! 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 wow. wow. <laughs> so I would encourage you all, since you know we are all very strong Don Johnson supporters on here, to go check out the trailer. I'll put a link. In the show notes for this episode, you can go watch this trailer. I'm not sure when it comes out. It's kind of a smaller indie film that's coming out. So I'm not sure wh- when it's going to hit theaters. But I was really impressed by the trailer. And including, it will say some words I've never said before, impressed by Vince Vaughn. I don't know. I don't believe it. <laughs> I'm skeptical. No, I, uh, I'm just relieved. I thought you were going to say Don Johnson uh, heard what I said in the music segment last <laughs> week. And he's still with me. Yeah, yeah. He's coming after you. Well, speaking of prison, let's go talk about this episode because Sonny, Sonny, man, I thought this episode was coming together great. And he was actually going to help really help somebody. Hey, he was trying. And then there's this huge twist. I can't wait to get to the twist. Let's, Let's go talk about this episode. All right, guys, this episode, like I mentioned, is really good, but pay particular attention to this episode because in an unfortunate spoiler accident that I had <laughs> while, while researching this episode, <laughs> the the characters in this episode will become very important in, in an episode at the end of season four. And ah, I wish I could take that see? spoiler back. Yeah, he asked me a question. I'm like, no, why did you do it? See, I thought something was funny because in the music, uh, I will save it for the music, but I, I thought something was a little off with one of the songs. And it, it, it makes sense that these characters would be returning. All I can hope for now is just forget. And then when the episode starts, oh, I know what's going to happen here. Okay, I can't wait. But just hope we forget. Melissa's very mad at me, though. Spoiling everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, this episode opens, and we're in 1980, and you can tell Sonny is slightly younger than what he is in 1986 when this episode aired on real TV because he's wearing a hat. I was going to say, when you wear a baseball hat, that means you're younger. And he's driving a different car. That counts, too. Yeah, it's a different Porsche. He's a, man, he's a Porsche man. He yeah. likes his Porsches. True. <laughs> he's also got a different yeah. partner, so I'm trying to keep um, track of all the partners. <laughs> 
I know he's got a lot of partners. <laughs> like, at what point was he actually partners with Evan? At what point was he actually partners with any of the other people? <laughs> I don't know, but this partner, he is kind of hard to forget with that awesome mullet he's rocking. Oh, I know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so we're coming in, and Don and his partner, Frankel, they're at the end. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> they're at the end of the day. They're talking about the case that they're working on busting out. And uh, he's just dropping Frankel off at his house. They have a quick chat inside the car. And then his partner gets out and he walks into his perfect family. Kids come running to him. Wife says it's time for dinner. He's got a beautiful house. And immediately I'm like, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah why would they stay on him any longer than they needed to right like yeah. why didn't something just drop him off and they don't show inside his house no show, I just show inside his house. as they're getting ready to eat dinner a masked man outside the home well he's not masked he walks out and then he puts on a mask he walks over to a window and pulls out a shotgun and shoots and kills frankel through the window in front of his children and his wife, and then we cut to the opening credits. So a very brutal, fast way to start this episode. Yeah, that's not delivery. That's uh, <laughs> also not the genre. <laughs> I knew you were going with that as soon as you said that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're out at Sonny's boat. It's we've caught back up to the current time, and Sonny's got a new girlfriend. He's got some bimbo on there. He picked up at the bar the night before. <laughs> At least she's actually attractive, uh, unlike all she, the other women. Isn't she gone. late for a flight? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she's like a waitress or, I don't know, a, a stewardess. Or, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. She's not staying for breakfast. No, no. He didn't even <laughs> offer her breakfast. She knows that. <laughs> Sunny is also watching the news. The news is talking about something very strange. And I'm just going to lay it out there right now. I am very anti-death penalty. So sorry if that upsets anyone out there. But I was quite shocked that the news was talking about that they were going to live broadcast a execution of a prisoner who happens to be a man named Hack. What was it? Is it just me or they used to do that in the 80s? Did they do that? Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah, they used to do that. <laughs> I don't think they did it in California, obviously, but they've done it in other states. That's not a, like a new thing. So when they were talking about it, I was like, oh, okay, whatever. They're going to kill another person in, like, on live TV, I guess. I don't know. I know that like that's been a plot to a movie or two where someone's live streamed someone getting killed on the internet. Well, I, th I don't and, think they actually... Uh, if I like, remember the movies correctly, everyone freaked out about it. Yeah, I don't think they actually videoed him, di the person dying. But I definitely remember it being a thing where they would be like at the execution and show that where the room was and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm not saying like... Maybe maybe that's like a that's a movie thing where like show them on the on the TV and everyone watches it. But it's like definitely I've seen it where they prepared for it and like the people show up and everything like that. Interesting, because on the on the mm. news broadcast they're talking about this like a debate between two people and one person saying it'll be good because it'll help deter crime. But it actually didn't feel like they were making a big deal out of it. And Sonny didn't seem like he cared that much either until he found out that it was Hackman that was going to be the live broadcast and hackman in the inter they actually go to him in the news broadcast and they do an interview with the man who's going to be put to death pretty pathetic he's saying he's done his time he's learned his lesson but it's, he's also saying it's kind of gross as being live broadcast <laughs> yeah no he's like no 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 he says he, he's okay with that because he mm. wants people to see what it's like when the system doesn't work for you basically he talks about uh, how like okay. the system it's the system's fault he's there but he's willing to like let to people to, to people to see like his mistakes he's made and all that stuff like that mm -hmm. even though he didn't do this murder but he's made mistakes in his life and it's okay that people will see it i guess that's yeah because that's the story that he sticks to later too yes he he is remarkably calm about it too <laughs> like so yeah it's this thing it's going down thursday like you know if you guys want to watch it's okay <laughs> after Crockett kicks out his girlfriend and goes and gets a real breakfast at a diner with his real girlfriend, Tubbs. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny's just talking to Tubbs about Hackman being a liar and it's all staged. Then Castillo comes walking up and says that a priest wants to talk to the Sonny, that he's got some info about the Hackman case. Sonny. But, but no breakfast for the lieutenant. No, no breakfast. <laughs> Not even a sweet roll. <laughs> That man can't eat a sweet roll. Sonny doesn't want to go do it. What's he doing at the diner? He has no coffee, no food. He's just <laughs> hanging out there. 
<laughs> just creepily following people around. <laughs> Sonny's kind of angry about it, but Castillo, in true dad form, says, tough. Go talk to the priest. You have to do it. You have no choice. So we go over to the church, and they're interviewing the priest, and it's both of them. It's the Tubbs and Crockett and Castillo. So all three of them are there. The priest is saying that he has a man that has confessed to the murder, and that he's dying, or he might be dying, so it's like he wanted to clean his conscience before he dies. The priest re- refuses to reveal who the man is, and the vice team asks, knowing what the answer is going to be. The priest isn't going to give up someone who from confession and this is when Sonny mm-hmm. also talks about that hackman is the one that killed his partner so him and castillo s- step aside and he talks about that he deserves it and then the priest asks what's the deal with Sonny?" and castillo says oh well he killed his partner and he's also the man that put him away too mm-hmm. that's why he said why would he the priest asked why would he ask me to speak specifically to Sonny?" And he said, because he's the man that put him away. At this point in the episode, Sonny is very adamant that he he's not buying this bull crap and he wants no part of this, which is about what I expected. It's just amazing how quickly his attitude changes. It does change pretty fast. I think I know why when, when we get there. He does change his mind pretty fast, but right here he is like, absolutely no way. He storms off. He leaves Castillo to talk to the priest. The priest says that, the man who he got in confession is worried that he wants to protect his family, but that this is where it gets weird. He specifically wanted to make sure that Sonny Crockett knew about it. That's why the vice team decided to run with this because this that's a little carrot here mm-hmm. that it was someone that Sonny or that someone that knows Sonny. We have a quick driving scene where Crockett is explaining to Tubbs how they got Hackman, that his partner was undercover infiltrating Hackman's gang, and then he got or the crime ring that he was involved in and that he was exposed and then the court proceedings proved that it was hackman that killed him because they found out that he was a cop it was all circumstantial evidence so he does say that and where they're off to is to the attorney general's office or the state attorney i think it's the state attorney and the duo show up to talk to waldman that's the man's name he's a former prosecutor who helped put hackman away but he is now an elected official as the state attorney and he's like in mid-election form. He's making sure he's being very careful because he's in the middle of, of an election, which he is. And then when the duo talk to him, he is very adamant. I am not reopening the Hackman case. I am not interested in talking about it. And this is where, John, where you start to see that Sonny is also starting to have second thoughts because he's like talking out loud. Like, oh, it was all circumstantial yeah. evidence. Yeah. Mind you, the district attorney, he he. he Rattles off a list of basically we got a witness against him. We found the murder weapon. We've got a picture of him actually shooting him, his your partner. <laughs> you know, we had this mountain. It was an open and shut case. Like, are you crazy, Crockett? <laughs> Especially in election time. Yeah. <laughs> so we go to the precinct, and now the whole team's having a meeting. the The entire vice team is there, except for Zito. The entire vice go. team <laughs> is there. They're going to go work the church, which is oh, this really got me because I was I've always been under the impression that the church and confession that does off limits to police, and so they're not going to ask the priest to, to give it up. What they're going to do is they're going to go to this church and work the crowd and try and pull out people who have like warrants or anything like that. When we get to that scene, I I was thinking back, I was like, are they sticking out a church? Like, like, (laughs) can you even do that? It felt wrong. That's exactly what what my thoughts were, too. It's like, I didn't. This feels like they shouldn't. They can't do this. Like, they couldn't use this information. That's just the Catholic in you guys. (laughs) Speaking of Catholic, it turns out this is the church of crime. (laughs) (laughs) You guys just didn't like that Gina was pretending to be a nun. I'm I'm slightly attracted to that nun. There's something wrong with me. (laughs) As everyone leaves, they have their assignments. They have a very short window on which they need to get this done because Hackman's execution is just right right around the corner. But Castillo grabs Sonny before he walks out of the office and hands him a file and says, you need to go talk to this person. And Sonny is not happy. So we have a short driving montage. The best. New car driving montage out to the prison. It's to be like, oh, he's going to have to go talk Mm -hmm. to Hackman. And this is where Mm -hmm. Sonny falls hook, line, and sinker for maybe they have the wrong guy. 
because he talks to Hackman and the conversation starts out at first that Hackman is saying, I'm making amends. I didn't actually kill this, your partner, but I've killed other people. And so I deserve to be for this to happen to me. Sonny's just listening. He has this look of that. He's unimpressed on his face the entire time. But Hackman is very emotional, very convincing and very He's making amends with Sonny. And by the end of it, you see on Sonny's face, especially after Hackman puts his hand on the glass. <laughs> yeah, that was like, weird. Slowly wipes oh, my it down. God. <laughs> so at this scene, when Sonny first shows up, Hackman's looking at him like hey, like he's like they're old friends. And then at about halfway through his little spiel, I'm expecting him to tell Sonny how he can have his collection of toenails. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then he does the oh Billy the end. Uh, it, I, I, obviously, I, I'm referencing the cable guy with Jim Carrey, but that yeah. that is immediately what popped into my mind. Like oh my god. <laughs> And, th- and maybe this is where I, I differ from Sonny. He said, they're going to kill me for the one I didn't do, you know, and I killed all these other people, but they're going to get me for the one I didn't do. Well, you killed all these other people, so I'm not going to waste my Monday <laughs> trying to figure this one out. <laughs> yeah, that was Case my thought, closed. too. Yeah, my thoughts were like, yes. who cares? You killed a bunch of other people. Okay, well, then see you later. <laughs> yeah, I got so to go what? Home. We were wrong about this one. We still got you, sucker. <laughs> yeah, we were right. It, overall, we were right. So I don't have time to waste on you. Sorry. Sunny is really shaken, though. He's got a heart of gold, that man. <laughs> Just leads them in the wrong directions. <laughs> so when we leave the prison, this is when we go over to, to the church. And so the whole vice team is spread around, except for Zwitek. He's inside of the van. And what they're doing is they're taking license plates, and then they're taking Polaroids. A real fancy Polaroid, Polaroid. camera. Man, I wish I could get myself one of those Polaroid cameras. <laughs> 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 okay like this is supposed to be a stakeout and they're trying to blend in and then they're taking pictures with this gigantic polaroid you know you know how those things it's the loudest click ever and it spits out a picture so it's like completely obvious it's not like these days when you take a picture with your cell phone you can kind of do it like discreetly yeah no, no it's nothing they're very about it. <laughs> obviously taking pictures of people going to mass I also have doubts in their facial recognition, where they take a Polaroid, yes. which isn't known for its quality. No. <laughs> and then fax it in a 1980s fax over to the <laughs> FBI offices, I think, yeah. someone in D.C. And then they're able to to match who that person is. Yeah, all within minutes? Or like, I don't understand what within was going on there. seconds. Yeah, like, they're like, yeah, that's <laughs> Alviero. Yeah, I mean, come on. We so, all know how what the fax machines were like in the night. Came like some crispy lasagna. <laughs> we recognize that one right away. <laughs> uh, we all know what the fax machines were like in the 90s. Forget the 80s. Come on. I just picture someone in an office somewhere ripping a fax off of a fax machine <laughs> and trying to match it to Polaroids, like a big box of Polaroids <laughs> they have under the desk. <laughs> Nope, not him. Nope, not him. Nope, not him. Kind of looks like him. Here's what I imagine. The other end of that fax, there's a poli- a beat police officer who loves Twinkies. Oh, yeah, that I was is- going to say, just like Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> you got yourself in trouble again, didn't you? After running almost everyone, and I'll just real fast, Gina's dressed up like a nun, and she's out on the street, and she's reporting in the license plate. That's that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing. I kind of like that thing. I appreciated that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they finally r- r- run across the name of someone who has a long laundry list of felonies, violent felonies, in Gus Alviero, which is interesting because in the opening... When Sonny's talking to his partner, they say two other police officers who are working Alviero. So you would think, maybe, mm. I don't know, maybe we should talk to the guy or the other team was investigating when we brought down the Hackman team. Just, you know, just a thought. Just a thought. Same mm. thing with Barkley. Like, oh, they were all tied together back then, too. Like, oh. We just never found him. Like, why did... Never mind. I won't get into that. That's, <laughs> that's jumping ahead. But, I mean, like, it's not weird that he just didn't show up to testify. They <laughs> ask him all about... Albiero and Barkley, like what they testified and why, or like why didn't they show up to testify? You have to question, like, is Hackman innocent? Maybe we should go ask the people who testified. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then we head back over to the precinct after they found out that Albiero was the one there that may have been the one that was in confession. Trudy, by the way, the real police officer of the group, has done all the work. She's handing out mm-hmm. files to everybody. Nice work, Trudy. Yep, like, you ran job, down Trudy. Albiero, everything about him. Yeah. Was she the one in the with all the pol- Polaroids? Yes. Pulling faxes off, matching them to people. 
<laughs> Trudy is literally doing everything. All everyone else does. It. Well, sorry, Tr- Trudy and Gina do everything. All Tubbs, Crockett, and Switek yes. know Zito. All they do is like run around shooting people and wrecking cars. And no, that's not true because Switek does a lot, though. True, he actually does the legwork. He, work on he a lot knew of how stuff. to work the fax machine. So yeah, like, but like he's doing like all the ones that have all the big files and they have to go through it. They make him and Zito go through it. All right, all right. So that was all going back to Tubbs and Crockett. Yeah, they don't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so then they go off to go talk to Alviero. It's just Tubbs and Crockett this time. They go to talk to him. He's saying he's the new man. That's the old him. It's not the way he is anymore. But also, by the way, I'm dying. I have pancreatic cancer and I have hours to live, not months. They ask him. Well, you testified at court that uh, he killed Hackman. And Alviero says, no, I testified his intent that he wanted to kill Frankel. But I didn't actually know that he did it. And then he finally comes clean and says, no, wait, Hackman was with me in Daytona that night. And he wanted to get revenge against Hackman because he was sleeping with Alviero's wife. And so he just wants him dead. And so he was willing to lie and say that it was him that killed Hackman just to put him away. Yep, that's oh, pretty much now. I, Hackman was apparently Hackman's not the only one sticking it to this guy's wife. <laughs> yeah, apparently everyone was. <laughs> Just for reference. Oh yeah. For the duo, I understand they start to think like, okay, well maybe Hackman's the wrong guy, but there's also a lot of story changes here, and you would think as detectives start to think like, whoa, I don't know, this seems kind of suspicious. Yeah, I mean, I guess mm-hmm. that. The, the thing is that Hackman has always said in when he was arrested that he was in Daytona and that was his alibi all along. And then when they brought in uh, Gus, he said, like, no, he wasn't with me. He said he wanted to kill him. And so then that I, I don't know. I just they just had it all played out so well, so, you know, like all written out so well. It wouldn't have made a difference in the case because I'm sure she would have lied. I would have thought their next stop would have been to talk about uh, to talk to the wife that was getting said bone. <laughs> <That was> getting- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you think that'll be the next stop? Like, hey, she was also boning these two people at the same time. Maybe we should talk to her. <laughs> Were you really bone uh, getting boned by him? <laughs> Let's see how many times <laughs> we can say bone <laughs> in a <that> segment. <laughs> So the duo run back over to the district attorney and they say, okay, we're starting to have doubts now. We talked to Albiero. He's saying that his testimony was wrong. And but Waldman is like, listen, I'm not reopening this. And then he eventually no. caves and says, get two corroborating witnesses. He will reopen. But by the way, if you find these witnesses, remember that you're going to get Hackman off and then you may not have any evidence to convict. So you may just get Hackman off and then not have anyone guilty of killing your partner. Yeah, I'll never solve it then. That's a point of contention for me. It goes back to Crockett's motivation here. I get he doesn't want the wrong guy to be in prison for killing his partner, but he doesn't seem to be concerned about who actually killed his partner. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I know, never mind like, that it wasn't it that it wasn't Hackman. Who was it then? <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be the top of my priority list. <laughs> yeah. Did he really not like Mullet guy? <laughs> <laughs> did, did Frankel smell? Is maybe, that why he just didn't like him? Maybe he was boning Frankel's wife. <laughs> I mean, they're uh, all... maybe they're all getting down with Felicia. That's where all this is going. <laughs> <laughs> so they do go back to the auto shop and they're going to go talk to Albiero again because now they need a second witness. He's concerned about testifying, but Sonny's reassuring him that they will protect him and say that they forced him to. All lies. Lies, Sonny. Why do you do this? You can't protect you <laughs> and the vice team can't protect nobody. They can't protect themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and so Albiero concedes and says okay tommy barkley was also with us that night so here's the other witness they got it they got two corroborating witnesses we bounced back to the precinct really quickly and trudy found barkley but he got killed in a prison riot so now they're done they don't have enough evidence to reopen it with the district attorney they feel like now that an innocent man is on death row and they can't do anything about it he was killed in the prison riot when this undercover cop Came into the prison. <laughs> and they were investigating the guards. It was a crazy fault. time. And they, they, the people were shooting the guards and everyone went crazy and he got stabbed. <laughs> that would be ironic. I know. 
Back at the auto shop, Albiero's talking to his wife, and she's really mad at him because she found a picture of a woman from his past, which we find out later it's his ex-wife, Felicia. I keep calling her Felicia, but it's Felicia. No, it should be. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I know where you were going with that. <laughs> Not going to say it. <laughs> I'm just going to think it. (laughs) The wife is really mad. She wants a decision by tomorrow. She leaves with the kids. But then outside, we see another car with the woman, which you can kind of tell from the picture. It's the same woman that she's sitting out on the street and she gets out and walks up to the auto shop. Albiero comes out of the office. He starts working on cars again. The woman comes walking up and Albiero sees her feet from underneath the car. So he gets up. When he sees her, she's pulled a gun out. He just starts to pray and then she shoots him and kills him. So he doesn't try and fight. He doesn't try and run. He doesn't try and plead. He just prays and he's dead. So mental note. Mental note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, the duo show up and homicide is there. and They're cleaning up the crime scene and they're there to identify the body. And then the, the on-site detective says it's clearly a contract job because wait a minute homicide showed up to a homicide <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> they showed up they called them in this <laughs> well i mean you know it, it's a tragedy they killed travolta's dad from saturday night fever <laughs> for the record travolta's dad in saturday night fever was a jerk he didn't want him to dance his mom was like no honey you can go dance all your heart out he thought he was gay because he liked to dance just saying. I may have watched that movie too many times. <laughs> Don't even get me started on Urban Played Cowboy. By Val- <laughs> <laughs> so while Sonny is there, he starts digging through paperwork with the sunglasses and he happens upon a picture that's been torn up. So he takes it over to the wife who's in the office and she identifies the woman as Albiero's ex-wife, a bad person, but he just couldn't let her go. She was always it was always a problem with him. And can we talk about how he, his wife is way too good looking for him? And why is she like 20 years younger than him? <laughs> I mean, he's a mechanic. How did he get her? A criminal mechanic. And he's got a wife that's like a 20 year old hottie. Oh, yeah. And a millionaire, too. <laughs> now the vice team are even more up shit creek here. <laughs> because now Albiero's dead. They Barkley is dead. They got nothing. But they got this picture that. Of a woman that might know the story, mo- mo- know more I- information. They did, and I'm trying to me- see if I remember correctly, did they get a written statement or like a certified statement from Albiero? That's why they weren't that concerned about it? I don't know. I kind of feel like that that's what they were talking about, that they didn't necessarily need him alive. <laughs> well, I guess they don't need him co- to cooperate <laughs> because there's also the priest. Mm, so there's mm-hmm. another witness. So yeah, they probably don't need. They don't need good old Gus. <laughs> nah, they didn't need him. <laughs> Back at the precinct, Switex br- brings in a report. They couldn't find any prints on the site at the auto body shop, so they got nothing. They got no leads on who killed them. And then Castillo asks about the card. So this postcard that has the picture of the ex-wife on it, and see if there's any info on it. It turns out that there's this picture of a restaurant in the background, and then it also says like the na- the neighborhood or the area no, it that says, it's in. It's for, it's like a it's a postcard. So she's mailed it to him, and on the back of it, it's got the city name, and they say out loud like, "Oh, it's this city." I forgot what whatever it was called something with an S. And then Swite text like, "Hey, that's my old stomping grounds. I that's where I became a cop first before I got to the big leagues." And he makes a joke, and then. And they show it to him. And of course, it's a restaurant. (laughs) He recognizes the restaurant right away. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, it's blah, blah, blah. This traveling like a food cart. We we use the term restaurant loosely. Yeah. (laughs) What is it called? It is the Venus Clam Trap. Oh, my God. I didn't even notice that. (laughs) She sells her clams from a truck. And that's all she sells is clams. (laughs) Is she yeah, buying the seashore? Her class. <laughs> <laughs> So the duo are off to go talk to the district attorney first and then off to the Venus clam trap. They stop off to talk to Waldman. They're begging him, please stay the execution. We need more time. We are oh, starting we to have this. Waldman's gonna tell them to go away. Shut up. Leave us alone. Even with one of the witnesses home. being killed, he's still <laughs> he's not like, really. Nah. <laughs> like, doesn't that seem fishy enough that maybe you should Stay it like a day? Nope. <laughs> hey, man, so, I was Walden. <laughs> so now off to the Venus Clam Trap. It is a food cart out in front of a stadium. Who knows what kind of stadium it is because it is Florida. It could be bullfighting. It could be high lie. It could be 
Football, who, baseball, who knows what the hell it could be. Who buys clams from a truck? <laughs> I knew he it. Clams knew at it. a sporting event. <laughs> no, since you said who, I was like, he's going to go, who wants to buy these clams from a truck? <laughs> since we're talking about boning people, who want a bone? Like, <laughs> it's an aphrodisiac. <laughs> Those are oysters, not clams. <laughs> John knows. <laughs> It's a Florida thing, okay? They Maybe when work. they go to games, they, they eat clams from a truck. I don't know. <laughs> and one of, in the scene, too. So they're parked out, taking out the clam truck. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Felicia sees something suspicious, and she makes a phone call. And when she makes the phone call, you can see the menu. And that's it. That's all they serve is clams. There's, like, steamed clams, boiled <laughs> clams, like fried clams. <laughs> Like, there's like no other option. John, I don't, I get don't know. calamari on a stick, please. <laughs> I don't know if you have a leg to stand on, though. You are in the land of gooey duck farms. Oh, gross. Looks like a big old <laughs> booger or something. It doesn't mean I eat them. <laughs> Just because other people are dumb enough to doesn't mean I am. <laughs> it, it's a sea booger. In case you were wondering what a gooey duck was. It's a <laughs> sea yeah. booger. Google it. It's it's really gross. <laughs> so the duo basically wait all day because they say that the event's going to end soon. But then by the time they go to get out of the car and go talk to Felicia and the FBI show up, it's like almost nighttime. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they what's wait going on quite there. a while. Yeah, but... <laughs> you waited around for a long time for the crowd to die down. <laughs> the FBI show up. They grab Tubbs and Crockett and pat them down, even though they say they're cops. They got to do the job. But they sneak Felicia and another man, who's clearly Barkley, out of the back of the of the clam trap. <laughs> right out <laughs> the <into> trap. It. <laughs> and they always make the FBI look so stupid. That's every cop show, though. Think about oh. a cop show where they don't make them FBI, except for obviously like <laughs> Criminal Minds, or you know. But they always make the, yeah, the uh, regular say- cops always make them look stupid, like they don't know what they're doing. So back at the precinct, Castillo basically says, like, yeah, I knew Barkley was in witness protection. I just didn't say anything. I know. He acts like he's not surprised. I don't know that he said that, but he was like, eh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. He was a surprise catch. They helped bring down multiple fences for money laundering. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they've had him for a while. I don't know why I didn't say anything before. He's a prize snitch. That's what he is. <laughs> also, in true Miami PD fashion, they had a witness protection. They had someone in witness protection. And didn't have him leave the city. No, I know. No, I think it was some, too, so he's not in Miami. He's somewhere else. They have to drive far. Somewhere within it, in a drivable distance. With a lot of windows. <laughs> Let's stick him in it a house with a bunch of be, It wouldn't happen to be Daytona Beach, would it? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> the next thing we have is a little last rites montage at the prison as Hackman's getting ready to be murdered. By the state. Sorry. Personal beliefs coming out there. They're shaving his head, getting his last meal. Uh, so it's just like a montage of that stuff. And so then we go over to Barclays. This is where I really want to get to. I want to point something out. Notice his last meal, not clams. <laughs> <laughs> no one's last meal is clams. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what he was eating, too. I was like, what is that? Prime rib? Is that roast beef? Is that? I thought it was like some sort of sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Says the vegetarian. I don't even know what prime rib looks like anymore. <laughs> you know this, too, especially toward the back end of this episode. Everyone at the prison must really like Frank because they are all being super nice to him. They are, and you see later, like in this scene, that he tries to give the guard his watch, and his guard's like really tempted to do it, like they were really close, but he just decides he can't. It's like the last moments of Harry and the Hendersons, where he's like <laughs> slapping Hackman. You have to go. <laughs> How dare you even compare those two? Harry was a sweet monster. He didn't know what to do. And every so guard has just, their like, shirt open. The gold watch in prison. Yeah, why would he have a gold watch in prison anyway? And a chain, heck, a gold necklace. Who knows where that was kept? <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot to mention in the precinct scene that the duo asked Castillo, "Like, can you get us Barclay's address?" And he's like, "Yeah." <laughs> yeah, I've had yeah. it all along. <laughs> Why didn't you guys ask before? So they're it's off actually to- my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> so they're off to go see Barkley, and I love this when they squeeze in the real Miami stuff. They don't drive out there; they go by boat. 
Of course. They just pull up to the back of the house and there's like a gate that goes out to the dock. And I, I just love it when they do that kind of stuff. They didn't have to drive there. They just took the boat. Because Don uh-huh. Johnson's like, I really want to drive a boat today. Let me drive my boat. <laughs> See, I could drive a boat. Look at me, boat champion. <laughs> well, and of course, you'd want to go in the back so it's not obvious that you're breaking into a protected <laughs> witness's safe yeah, house. what the heck were they doing? And even Tubbs is like, what are we doing? Why are you getting your gun loaded? What's going on here? And he's, well, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna find out the truth no matter what. Well, wait a minute, I didn't know what that was gonna happen. <laughs> oh, and off this ride. Yeah, like, yeah huh? um, I'm not even on board with this. <laughs> yeah, and they do break in. Like Sunny goes around the back, uses a lockpick and picks lock to get inside. And they think they're slick. They've got them <laughs> all figured out. <laughs> but then Felicia and Thomas bust out with their shotguns. Actually, have the duo by surprise so i do want to point out tommy is played by bill raymond he he was also in 12 monkeys summer of sam but we would know him from hbo's the wire he played the greek and felicia is played by olga carlados who she did mostly foreign films but she was also in once upon a time in america and she played prince's mother in the movie purple rain i cannot figure out how she played prince's mother in purple rain she's not that old it must have now i have to admit you've never never seen seen purple Purple rain Rain. (gasps) oh So ha, ha, is, ha, ha. is it like a flashback scene or something, maybe? No, because his mom's yeah. like, there's no flashbacks. There's no. Okay. Well, one there thing is, I know about not... Purple Rain is it's got Prince and he drives a motorcycle. I'm going to be completely <laughs> honest with you. The only reason I brought her up in the guest stars was because I knew you were going to have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> it's always going to have to admit he ain't never seen Purple Rain. <laughs> I love the song. Does that count for anything? I can't believe you've never <laughs> seen it. They have sex on the beach. I mean, come on. I'm listening. On, and on the back of a motorcycle? He, <laughs> him and, I think, Apollonia? Tell me. Eventually, they talk down from the guns, and Barkley just throws out there, like, hey, by the way, I have blanket and total immunity. So whatever you're going to talk to me about, like, it, you can't do anything to me. And so Sonny's like, all right, cool. Let's go take a walk. Let's go step aside. Felicia's being kind of bossy in the conversation so let's just step away Tubbs, you stay here with felicia come on tommy let's mean you go take a walk Tubbs giving <laughs> felicia the eye like now that we're alone <laughs> don't forget i got this sawed off in my jacket yeah <laughs> uh-huh. while we're doing this to keep cutting back to hackman getting ready to be executed and then we go back to barclays and sunny's like so like you have a nice place here kapow <laughs> Kablooey. Yeah. <laughs> so he's just up and starts trying to murder him. <laughs> he says he's trying to get the truth, but really I think he's just trying to beat him into telling him what he wants to hear. That is true. That I would totally believe that he wants to hear a certain thing and he I mean he beats him, he throws him into the pool, he starts holding him underwater. And this is attempted murder. Eh, I was okay with it. <laughs> Only if he would have murder of a protected Felicia. witness. He yeah, also think... threatens that he'll call the people in Chicago. He'll tell the people who he's hiding from. Oh, he'll totally do that too. By yeah. the way, so <laughs> that's not a, that's not a threat. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm okay with all of it because those two could blow up for all I care. <laughs> <laughs> Barkley eventually confesses that it was a button man. They had hi- they had a hired gun to kill. His partner. Everyone knew Frankel was a cop and that he didn't testify because of his wife or the ex wife of Al Nero. Felicia, too. Mm-hmm. So they just let Hackman take the blame for it, but he wasn't the one that pulled the trigger. Sonny says, quote, No one is that good, pal. And Barkley just shakes his head and goes, She is. I don't believe it. <laughs> I mean, she's prison really mom, for God's Felicia. sake. Yeah. <laughs> So now the duo are up against the clock. They have to rush to get to stop the to stay the execution. They're in the final hour here. And so they drive their so, boat out. <laughs> so you go boating. That's One the important fastest way. <laughs> See, Cocky was in such a hurry to get back and rescue this guy on death row. He forgot to ask one very important question. So who did you hire to kill my partner? Yeah, who did you hire? Who was the person you hired? Who he has immunity. He, he has immunity. He can. Yeah, he's already ratting people out anyway. Who's this dude from <laughs> Buffalo? You got his number? <laughs> so they rush by boat out to the governor's mansion and he's 
just happens to be in the backyard having a dinner party. And they run past Waldman, who's kind of protesting a little bit, delivers a paper to the governor that says that we have reasonable doubt to say that Hackman wasn't the trigger man. We have two witnesses that co corroborate the story, and you are going to execute an innocent man. Walden tries to stop him, but the governor says, nope, I will not allow this injustice, <laughs> and makes the call to stay the execution on Hackman. And it doesn't just stay the execution, it exonerates him. Yeah, that was a little bit of a stretch. I think you can stay an execution up based on yeah. that, but don't you still have to have like a someone look into it, like another trial or um, a committee, like look at, at the evidence the and stuff? <laughs> and I don't buy it because it's Florida. They don't. They just kill people <laughs> randomly in Florida. I've seen my front lines. Okay, <laughs> not good in Florida. So I'm pretty sure there's a whole appeal process. The governor can stay in execution. He can't up and just set you free. There's, there's this whole, uh, you notice how everyone's story was that Frank was just a, a patsy and that they were really all together in uh, Daytona, but everyone was owning Frank girlfriend. Yeah. So apparently no, everyone's story is that nobody liked Frank. True. But they really liked his wife. <laughs> yes. No, that's not his wife. It's That's Gus's wife. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So she was married yeah, it's to his Gus. girlfriend. Yeah. It's yeah, Gus's okay. ex-wife. It's his girlfriend. <laughs> we're sharing. <laughs> so now we're to the final scene. And this is this is the twist that I've been waiting for. The duo are waiting there. And Crockett personally being there for Hackman when he comes out of jail. Like, hey, I'm sorry. You were the wrong person. I know that I worked this case. I know that I was very bitter about my partner being killed, but I was wrong here. You are clearly an, an innocent man. Hackman comes out and he says, thank you. And Sonny says, I'm just doing my job. And then Hackman says, just like I knew you would. And that's when the hair on the back of my neck started to stand <laughs> up. And that's when Barkley and Felicia pull up and you find out that it was all their plan. They all have immunity now. Hackman can't be tried again because it'd be double jeopardy. Yep. Barkley and Felicia have blanket immunity. And Hackman admits then that he was the one that killed Frankel. A plan uh, from Frank the very Frankel's beginning. Frankel's would be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you, how could Sonny ever look at Frankel's family again? Oh, I, I don't think he ever does because he, <laughs> he never saw him after that anyway. <laughs> he, he doesn't even know where his own kid is. How look is he gonna... at his own family. I was going to say, can't even look at his whole family. Hackman says that Alviero was going to die. He had, he did have cancer. He was dying. And he wanted his family to be taken care of. So he bought his confession. And then Barkley and Felicia are in on it, which they have a very passionate... Hackman and Felicia have a very passionate kiss as he gets into the car. That's and a sick old three-way They just played Sonny beginning to end. And you see the crushed look on his face mm -hmm. that he thought... For once, he was doing the right thing. Yeah, and he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and then they drive away and wave at him like jerks. Like they drive <laughs> right before then, there was a brief scene where Sonny lays the guilt on the DA. The DA's like, you've cut the legs out into my career. I'm not going to get elected. I have to chase ambulances for the rest of my life. So now here he is. He's someone who he had a good relationship with. He did the right thing by bringing down Hackman. Like he, A bunch of it got ruined in one fell swoop. And I gave that teaser at the beginning of this episode because later, this episode will be even more important. Frankel's killer is still in the wind. And that's the end of this episode. And like I said, it was really good. There was twists and turns. I know that it can be seen. Melissa, I know you mentioned that it was a little slow yeah. for a Vice episode, yeah. but I really appreciated how it worked its way through that we got to the end with that twist. That including my spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> Spoiled yourself. You didn't spoil me. But <laughs> Let's go talk about the music in this episode. We have a couple new artists and then, you know, you know my advice. Let's go talk about this music. All right, John, no Don Johnson music this week. Unfortunately, no Don Johnson yeah. music this week. But we do have someone we've seen a lot, and there's more to come. Oh, yeah. So we have 
Good old Peter Gabriel back in the music. <laughs> I remember him from such bands as Genesis and such albums as So. Which his album names always throw me for a loop, especially those three. That's what's funny about, so he, when he went to do his solo career, his first, I want to say four albums just titled Peter, Peter Gabriel. And so they are known as one, two, and four because he didn't name them. Just Peter Gabriel, he just called them after, uh, Peter Gabriel. And then each one just has a little different cover art where basically his face is, is slightly covered by a different object. He then decided, okay, well, the record company wants me to give these a name. So the next three were all two-letter words. So, us, and like, O oh, or something like that. So yeah, yeah Peter Gabriel doesn't like the names. <laughs> so we have the song, We Do What We're Told. It is also off of the album. So the fourth five songs from that album that appear in Vice. <laughs> they just committed to the whole album. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Just, <laughs> come on, guys. Just play the whole album. Let's just go front to back. Oh, let's see. What's new with Peter? about Peter Gabriel? What can we talk about? His middle name is Brian. Did you know that? <laughs> His great, great, great uncle was Sir Thomas Gabriel. He served as mayor of London from 1866 to 1877. <laughs> We're going way back. Oh, yeah. In 1970, Peter Gabriel played flute on Cat Stevens' album, Mona Bona Bona Jacon. <laughs> I was like, Mona no, Bona. I, I... <laughs> Mona Bona. Mona Bone Jack Con. I know I'm not saying that right. It's actually spelled Mona Bone. That, that just that doesn't seem right at all. So, and dude, come on. Peter Gabriel has seven total songs in the show. And this song is not only used in this episode, but it's used in season four's episode Deliver Us from Evil. I'm going to have to talk about this song again next season. <laughs> what more can I say about Peter Gabriel? We've already talked about his dreams. What else can we talk about? <laughs> okay, let's move on to someone who's new to music. We have Fernando Villalona. I am going to butcher a lot of this. <laughs> so bear <laughs> with me. <laughs> the song is called Mor Sonata. And he is a, <clears throat> a Dominican merengue singer who began in the early 70s. He actually... Began singing at an early age, but he became popular after participating in El Festival de la Vaz, an amateur TV talent show. Shortly after appearing on there, he was hired by merengue icon Wilfredo Vargas to be a part of his band Los Hayos del Rey, but left soon after because his popularity began to pretty much he pretty much outgrew the band. He became more popular than the band itself. He went through a p period of drug and alcohol abuse, which is actually considered, a lot of people consider his best era of merengue, which is kind of like Miles Davis-esque, you know. But he's also considered the most important merengue singer in Dominican history. Did he also yeah. run for president? Or like, like the other Latin singers no. that we had just a few weeks ago? <laughs> No, no, he, he he didn't go to Harvard or run for president or is in a very popular current television show. <laughs> he did participate in We Are the World, the Spanish version. And I mean, he was pretty much the headliner. And then there were some like smaller, you know, lesser known artists like Shakira, Ricky Iglesias and Ricky Martin. But he was the headliner. Wow. The headliner. On, the, on that one? <laughs> I'm sure they had him in the back somewhere. He wasn't like... even on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so the dude's released 25 albums. He's re received so many awards that I have never heard of. In my opinion, he is the greatest merengue singer in <laughs> the history of the world. <laughs> We're going to leave it at that. I commend you, John, for not being a Spanish speaker and willing to tackle that, not just saying, I'm not going to talk about Fernando Villalona. I'm just gonna skip him. <laughs> so, so uh, belly, a uh, belly clap for you for willing to take on all that Spanish. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I will be honest with you. Uh, I know mer the merengue is a dance. I have no idea what kind of music that you dance that dances to, or even how to do it. So I know it from Dirty Dancing. They do the merengue <laughs> and also the okay. pachula. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't sing pachula. 
No. <laughs> Merengue. Don't you patula to his music. <laughs> Our last artist is Meatloaf and his song Standing on the Outside from the 86 album Blind Before I Stop. Before you get started, I have a couple questions for uh, Melissa. In the 80s, oh. <laughs> what was with bands that had album covers of like skeletons or or devil women with their breasts showing riding motorcycles that clearly don't make music but fitting that kind of album cover i have no idea i guess that it was supposed to like to be the shock value right i guess I because mean, meatloaf albums definitely don't deserve that kind of cover art <laughs> yeah i don't understand i will say right now like before we talk about him i don't understand the meatloaf thing like i don't get why people like his music so <laughs> sorry like wait a minute this album has more than the feeling on it something's yeah. wrong here <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Let's get into some meatloaf. He was born Marvin Lee a day. He legally changed his name to Michael, but most people know him as Meatloaf. Only his friends call him Loaf. I call him Loaf. <laughs> <laughs> Good buddies, me and the Loaf. Uh, he's originally from Dallas, Texas. Most known for his Bad Out of Hell trilogy. This is nuts. The Bad Out of Hell trilogy, which I, I, I know a, a one or two of the albums. I didn't realize it was a trilogy. But they have sold more than 50 million copies. Even now, almost 40 years later, it still sells, on average, 200,000 copies a year. Damn. What yeah. is it with Meatloaf? For the low? <laughs> Bad Out of Hell? Stayed on the charts for nine years. What? People right, love that album. I'm going to have to listen to that cover to cover again just to see. Just to see. And for you Meatloaf fans out there, I know you're probably yelling at your... Yeah, probably yelling at us right now. <laughs> you're probably yelling at your phone as you listen to this podcast right now. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to give it a shot, okay? I'm, I'll, I'll give it a shot, I promise. I'll report back next week on my Meatloaf adventure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> so, dude, in total, he sold about 80 million albums. Wow. He's also appeared in over 50 movies and TV shows. What? 50? So his most 50. I thought it was just the one. one. <laughs> That's no. all I know him from. <laughs> oh, oh, don't worry. His most notable roles are Eddie from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, he was I in that, okay. Robert Paulson, or Bob, with bitch tits, in Fight Club. <laughs> His name was Robert Paulson. His name, His name was, Robert, was Paulson. Robert Paulson. His guys, name yeah, was, Robert, was Paulson. Robert Paulson. <laughs> he played Tiny in Wayne's World. God damn it. Okay, now I'm looking like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no one and he also <laughs> played Jack Black's dad in Tenacious D in The Pick of Destiny. Also provided vocals on the film's opening song, Kickapoo. <laughs> A little more Vice, uh, or I should say Don Johnson crossover. Appeared on an episode of Nash Bridges. Oh, of course he did. <laughs> he is also good friends with Hugh Laurie and appeared in an episode of House. Wow. Fantastic hmm. episode. Let's go with a little bit of history on The Loaf. His first band was Meatloaf Soul. Meatloaf was a nickname given to him from his high school football coach because of his weight. <laughs> uh, the His band Meatloaf Soul often changed their name and guitarists. So as he changed guitarists, then they became Popcorn Blizzard. They changed guitarists again, then they became Floating Circus. <laughs> Floating Circus, by the way, opened for bands like The Who, The Stooges, and The Grateful Dead with some, some pretty good regional success. Based on that regional success, he would join a production of Hair no. and would be invited... No. No. <laughs> <laughs> And he would be invited by Motown Records with co with one of his co-stars to record a, a few singles. And from there, he would be cast in the stage show, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Based on that stage show, they would make a movie out of it. He would star in that movie. That movie would become popular. He would do the soundtrack to that movie. And then he would record Bad Out of Hell. And Damn. from there... On, out the gate and famous. I clearly, clearly did not know anything about Meatloaf. I felt like I had a base understanding of him. I clearly knew nothing. You were a fool. So, really. a couple <laughs> <laughs> objects in the view <laughs> mirror are closer than they appear, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> 
A couple random facts. In 76, he recorded lead vocals for Ted Nugent's album, Free For All. He met co-singer of the song Paradise by the Dashboard Light, which is one of his more famous songs. That, that might be one you guys might have actually heard. He met her, Ellen Foley, and he was the understudy for John Belushi in the National Lampoon Show on Broadway. This just Apparently, keeps getting weirder. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, he met John Belushi in 72, and they were buddies. And so Belushi pitched him to be his understudy for the show. Wow. There's a little bit more strange. A man named Meatloaf was a vegetarian for 10 years. <laughs> He's not anymore. <laughs> Quitter. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. It just said was. <laughs> it said was. So I'm assuming he eats meatloaf now. <laughs> Turns out, Meatloaf, not the guy you thought he was. Really different history. From the stage, to Rocky Horror Picture Show, to Bad Out of Hell, to 80 million album sales. And I know I was poking fun album covers and stuff, and yeah, I got proven wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Whoops. Once again, things went down a different road I was totally unprepared for. (laughs) Just when I think I have a... I have an understanding. Well, John, before we leave the music segment, I got a question for you. We got a tweet sent to us by at Dream19. He was asking about if you are or us, but specifically you, John, since you're the our, our music guru on this show, had any information on how Miami Vice put together its music for the episodes? Because as this person mentioned, that the music is always so spot on. And so who are these people that were behind the scenes that were choosing the music? That is a really good question. And it's a hard one to answer because no one's ever been completely straight about that. So here's the deal. Fred Lyle was an assistant producer for 40 episodes of Vice, basically from 84 to 86. And he was also the music coordinator or consultant, at least listed as the music coordinator or consultant in eight episodes. Fred Lyle has spent most of his career as a music coordinator. So he actually had a big role in decide- in helping choose the music. And from what I've read, I've seen some interviews, he's a lot of times they... When they talk about Vice, basically the the Vice's connection with like the MTV music culture, he's been interviewed a few times. He also is kind of responsible for some of the music for Nash Bridges. Uh, so he was also uh, <laughs> he also had a credit for Last of the Mohicans. Outside of that, no one is specifically listed. There are other people who are listed as music consultants. So you have Phil Galston, who was music consultant listed for four episodes. He is also, according to his IMBD, known for soundtracks for What Happens in Vegas, Definitely Maybe, and the movie The Firm. Ken Kushnick also was a music consultant for four episodes. He is also listed in credits for the music department for movies like Look Who's Talking, Look Who's Talking Now, Breakdown with Kurt Russell, and Muppets from Space. <laughs> that took a turn. That's the only one I care about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the David Pasek is also a music consultant for four episodes. He's also listed a credit as music d- department. Also for Look Who's Talking. And The Next Karate Kid and Necessary Roughness. Between those four guys... They probably had a, a fair amount of input on it. But based on other stuff I've read, Michael Mann and Jen Hammer also had a good amount of say when it came to the music. To give you an example, a lot of people talk about how the Glenn Fry episode, that Michael Mann was driving in his car and heard the Glenn Fry song. And that's what, like, inspired him to like do the storyboard for the episode obviously that's not how it always broke down i think outside of the music department and these specific four people i just mentioned i think jan hammer had an opinion in there as far as some of the music but everything i see with jan hammer specifically about composing so i don't see anything that referenced him actually picking it so i would say probably one of those four people more than likely fred lyle yeah, and they, and like this person mentioned, so it has the name listed as Jason, they do a such a great job of picking out the music. And then it all goes back just to the birth of the show. 
that the birth of MTV Cops, that that's what this show was supposed to be, and that the music and clothing was so important to, to the show. That's why we took the music out into its own segment. Just to put it in the context, Fred Lyle was... Uh, the reason I say he was mostly involved is because... He also had an assistant producer credit, but he was only involved from 84 to 86. And then the other three guys came in for episodes in 87 and 88. I think after the third season, the music's going to change. It's going to shift a little bit because different people are picking it. We really appreciate you reaching out to us, Jason, and uh, we hope we're able to get you mostly there as you can tell like this it's like a collection of people that work behind the scenes on the music but that sounds like that's your main guy and like i say we really do appreciate you s- sending us a message and we would love to hear feedback from anyone you can tweet at us at go with the heat or email us go with the heat at gmail.com let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode All right, I'll kick off this week. I really enjoyed this episode. I've said it a couple times as we've gone through this breakdown. I really, really enjoyed this episode. I thought it was really good. I thought that the story arc was really well done, how they investigated the the people that could have gotten Hackman off. It was weird how they all were witnesses in the case, too. So I don't know. That kind of left kind of a weird feeling that they could have done more police work at the beginning but all in all it was a really good episode and it twists and turns we have that big twist at the end i don't know i really really liked it this is we've had a few in a row here that i've really enjoyed melissa what are your final thoughts on this episode well seeing as i have seen this episode several times i will say that my opinion has changed on it when i first saw it i thought it was a great episode that I didn't know what was going to happen, the twists and the turns and the, you know, the plot twist at the end. But on rewatch, it's it, for me, it's boring because <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I already know what's going to happen. <laughs> and quite frankly, I don't like him. So <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing to do with what happens in the future. Is yeah, it? exactly. So I don't care. I think he should have been killed. So, <laughs> hey, there you go. No, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I also see where John's coming from where it's like it feels like it's kind of strange that he just flips a switch and he's like no i think you're innocent like when he was so in the beginning he was like "Uh aha this is laughable that he could be innocent he's so guilty which i think he knew in his heart of hearts that he was guilty but i don't i don't know what i guess i don't know the motivation behind why he fought so hard he's like has a good heart and he's a good person so he thinks he's what he's got to do the right thing because he hardly ever can do the right thing in his job i guess you know what i mean (laughs) no i mean i'm not i'm not being like sarcastic i'm saying because of his, what he does in his job. It's yeah. Like a lot of times what he does in his job is the right thing to do legally, but not the right thing to do in his conscience. Well, that's what happened last week when he says at the end, when Tubbs asked him, is it all worth it? He's like, it has to be. Enough. Mm-hmm. It has to be enough. Is it all enough that, you know, that, that she's going to get to start over? And yeah, it's got to be enough. But but it's not. So and I think that's what that stems from. Is that It's like, finally, I, I can do something that I know is right. That. I know when my heart's right and it's the right thing to do. And then his face. I know. I like end, That's why I hate you... it so much. <laughs> you heard him. You heard him. John, what are your final thoughts? I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. You know, yeah. it's just, it's hard to follow. I loved last week's episode. I, I was gushing about it at the end. It, it was okay. It just didn't blow me away. I, I guess I'm still riding that high from Streetwise. <laughs> um, it, I felt like it made Crockett look like a boob. <laughs> uh, a little bit <laughs> like how do you recover <laughs> yeah i mean total kid in the nuts for him i i just i question his motivation the way he flipped the switch and the way he gets you know he gets like he always gets in this episode he, he gets so devoted into the case and he gets so passionate about the case but the the problem with me is that i would have expected the exact opposite reaction from crockett's character in that i would have thought he would have stopped at nothing to make sure frank didn't get out of prison or didn't get away with it you know because he killed my partner but instead he goes on the crusade to prove him innocent well now he knows who killed frankel and he let him go he put an awful lot of work in for someone that he already found guilty i think (laughs) tubbs maybe should have stepped in and just Knock some sense into him or something, you know. <laughs> but once again, Tubbs wasn't really in this episode. No, no, he was just kind of in the back. He was just kind of rolling with the flow, just in the background, like uh, whatever you say, Sonny. <laughs> Let's go break into the protected witness's house. Why not? I got twenty minutes. 
<laughs> so I don't know. Maybe it's because it, of how bad it made Crockett look, or maybe it was just he was trying so emphatically to prove him innocent. I was skeptical from the beginning about him being innocent in the first place. So at the end, it was like, damn, see? <laughs> I told I you, it. Crockett. <laughs> I knew it. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, gowiththeheat at gmail.com, or you can tweet at us, at go with the heat. If you want to find other ways to contact us, you can go to the website, gowiththeheat.com, click on About Us. You can find the ways you can talk to John, you can talk to Melissa, you can talk to me. You can find all of our official accounts. You can find show notes. You can find all the links to subscribe. Did you know that we put together the notes with links for all the guest stars, for the music, everything you would need to know other than listening to the episode? What else you would need to know about this episode of Miami Vice? You can find the show notes, go with the heat.com. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal. <laughs>